Welcome to the Every Nation Dorado Congregation. We exist to honor God by establishing Christ-centered, spirit-empowered, and socially responsible churches and campus ministries in every nation. Here's a look at this week's announcements. Join us every Monday as we fast and pray corporately. We meet for face-to-face -face prayer between 5.30 and 7 p.m. Please take note that every first Monday of the month, the men and women meet separately to pray. We start off together with worship at 5.30 p.m. Thereafter, the men go upstairs. The next meeting will be Monday, the 4th of July. We will be hosting our AGM on the 24th of July between 2.30 p.m. to 4 p.m. All members of Every Nation Vintook are welcome to attend. Please sign up on our comms groups link or at the info desk. A Zoom link will be provided. For further inquiries, contact the church office on 081-127-0611. Our WK ministry is seeking volunteers to serve at the mental hospital. Do you have a heart to minister to patients by serving soup and sharing the Word of God? Then join us as a volunteer once a week between 9 and 10 a.m. starting the first week of July. Please sign up at the information desk. If you have any further questions, please contact Julia at 081-128-6381 and Grenda at 081-271-4031. All current and new volunteers are invited to our volunteers orientation on Saturday the 2nd of July at 10 a.m. Thank you for serving with us as we honor God and make disciples. Our intercession ministry will be hosting a prayer camp weekend from the 8th to the 10th of July at Rock Lodge. If you want to learn to pray, grow in your prayer life or you already love prayer, this camp is for you. Teachings will be by Pastor Eric Bapatel, our Every Nation Southern Africa Prayer Director. Cost of the camp is $1,420 Namibian dollars per person. Meals and accommodation included. Payments can be made to our church account using the following reference. Your name underscore prayer camp. Please sign up at the information desk or contact Auntie Barbara Yakwebi. You're all invited to join our hospital outreach on Saturday the 16th of June from 2.30 to 4 p.m. We will gather at the parking area of the Central Hospital. If you have any further questions, please contact Auntie Katrina on 081-842-3166. We're excited to announce that our mid-year prayer and fasting week will take place from Sunday the 17th of July to Saturday the 23rd of July. Corporate prayer will take place from Monday to Friday at 5.30 to 7 p.m. We look forward to how God will move in our church and community as we focus on His greatness in this week. We will celebrate the end of our week of prayer and fasting with a Passion Night on Saturday night, the 23rd of July from 6 to 9 p.m. Worshipping and lifting up the name of Jesus Christ. Visit our website for any additional information at ianvintook.org Let's commit to read, understand, believe and obey the Word of God. Enjoy the service! Hello everyone and welcome once again to our online broadcast. It's always a blessing to be together and I pray that this messages uh, online have been ministering to you. I've, had, I've heard a couple of testimonies of people that have not managed to make it to our live service but uh, they have been blessed through the Word of God being taught through this medium. And so we're celebrating God that His Word is not limited and that the Holy Spirit will still reach uh, you where you are. If you are in town, please do join us. Uh, there's something special about the fellowship and being together. And if you're watching us overseas, it's, um, it's important that you have that fellowship with other believers as well. I just want to emphasize uh, our building project that we have been currently uh, been embarking on, and we're trusting God for the finances. Every cent counts, and so we haven't taken a loan for this project, and so therefore we're trusting that God will provide and that God will move on your hearts. And if 
If he does, please do uh, partner with us and uh, whatever it is that the Lord um, is leading you uh, to give, that it will be for the benefit of the kingdom of God and also that the rewards uh, will be yours in eternity and in this life as well. And so we continue with our series today on a good church, a, 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 a series on the book of Ephesians uh, that we started a couple of weeks ago. I'm going to pray for us and then we're going to get right into the word. Father, we thank you, Lord, that your word is rich, Father God, and able to transform our lives and fulfill your will in our lives. And we pray, God, that the teaching that we have been receiving, that it won't be limited, Father God, just to what we hear, but that it will become a revelation that we apply in our lives, especially today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And so uh, the first week we spoke about the introduction to the book of Ephesians. We spoke about how um, uh, the, the city of Ephesus, um, based in um, modern day Turkey, uh, was was really custodian of the the religion of Artemis or the religion of or what they call um, um, Diana, and so we spoke about that in the first week and the blessings that we have in Christ. Second week, Pastor Philip shared on salvation, the identity, the fact that we are included. And last week, we spoke about the tenets from the Word of God, a spiritual family, the importance of not just being distant and and um, uh, sort of um, just conceptual in our engagement, in our walk with our spiritual family, but that we actually are part of what's happening. That's why the Word of God in the book of Hebrews says, do not neglect the fellowship, the gathering of the saints, as some are in the habit of doing. And so it's really important because it's in that gathering that the whole body supplies what everyone needs and where there's leadership and accountability. And so I want to encourage you if, you, if you missed that message, please go back and, and listen to that one. It's, it's got much more than I summarized here. Today we're talking about natural family, chapter five, and next week we'll uh, culminate this series with spiritual war and victory, which is chapter six. Now uh, we're going to go right into chapter chapter five, and um, the theme that we have for today is imitating God. That number one, we will personally as individuals imitate God. And number two, that our marriages will imitate God. And number three, that our parenting and our children will imitate God. So we're going straight to Ephesians chapter five. We're picking up from chapter one. It says, therefore, be imitators of God. And if you go back to chapter four, he begins to lay out very practical elements of being living a life that is worthy of, of the calling that we have in Christ, the calling out of the world into the body of Christ in that association with, with Jesus, that we now live a life worthy, no longer talking a certain way, no longer living a certain way, no longer in idolatry, no longer in immorality. And so he, he gets very practical. And so I want to encourage you, if you're in a space where you're not living consistent with these, these teachings, that you will repent and make that change, even as we are teaching it. There's no better time to repent than right now. You don't have to postpone it. You don't have to wait. As the word is coming, the very word that is coming to you gives you the ability to repent and obey the word of God if you mix it with faith. And so he says, therefore, be imitators of God. This is massive because he's calling us to imitate someone that usually has the qualities and the caliber and the, the, the descriptions of being so transcendent and different and holy that it's impossible to say that we can imitate God. But this is what the Apostle Paul is teaching. He's saying that because we have received the Spirit of God, we have become God's family. Now let us imitate our Heavenly Father. Let's imitate God. And he says, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. The same way that children imitate their parents. Let's not live as if we're imitating 
Artemis and Diana and the world, but let's live and, and many other uh, role models that we have. You know, people have tremendous amount of secular role models that they aspire to become like, especially in the area of their career or in the area of their finances or in the area of, 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 of whatever it is, their business. And many times all these role models have a very incongruent life because they might say something good on this side and have a great business, but their family is falling apart. I mean, we saw just in the news, one of the very wealthy men around the world, his daughter is, now wants to, to, to change her surname and, and doesn't want anything associated with, with the father. And so we see that even though we, we want to admire people in a certain area, there are always areas of those people's lives, these person's lives that, that, that are not worth emulating, not worth imitating. But when the Word of God tells us to imitate God, it is a comprehensive imitation in every area of our lives as beloved children. And then verse 2, he says, and walk in love. Walk in love. Walking is not a passive action. It is an active uh, verb. It is something that you have to get up and do. Walk in love. Be active in expressing your love. And then he says, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. That, that's the example. The word of God says, no greater love does anyone have except that he lay down his life for his friends. And so the, the same way that Christ gave himself up for us is the way that we ought to walk and give ourselves up for the Lord in loving God and in loving others. And then it says, he gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God, which is exactly what uh, the apostle Paul is teaching here. The word of God is showing us that when we walk in love, when we give ourselves up, we become a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. And then verse 3 goes straight to the practical. He says, but sexual immorality, in contrast to this fragrant offering and sacrifice and giving yourself up for, for others and walking in love. The contrast is sexual immorality. And he says, but sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. And so he's saying, look, there's a life that God is calling us to. He's calling us to imitate him. Now that we are no longer part of the idolatry of the world, no longer worshiping Artemis, no longer part of that uh, vile, um, dysfunctional society that we are now part of God's family. There's a way that we ought to conduct ourselves and there are certain things that shouldn't be found among us, shouldn't even be mentioned among us. And number one that he points out is sexual immorality. Now what sexual immorality? Sexual immorality is fornication, any kind of sex outside of marriage, fornication, and then any kind of perversion of God's design of sexuality, which is supposed to be between a man and a woman that are not blood relatives. And so a father cannot have sexual relations with his daughter. Absolutely an abomination. A man cannot lie and have sexual relations with another man. A woman cannot have sexual relations with another woman. All of these are various kinds of sexual immorality. A, a human being cannot have sexual intercourse with an animal and anything else. All of those are perversions which the Bible refers to as sexual immorality, regardless of your orientation. Some of us, our orientation is to sleep with a woman if we are a man, and it's still sexual immorality when it's done outside of the bounds of marriage. In the same way as homosexuality, pedophilia, or any other new thing that man is inventing in their appetites right now. And so it says, Sexual immorality, all impurity, and impurity refers to spiritual impurity. Any kind of engagement in spiritual things that are outside of Christ is occultic and impure and needs to be um, completely 
completely eradicated among the believers, among the saints, the holy ones. And then covetousness, which many people usually don't check themselves in the covetousness. And you will know covetousness in the way that you desire for the things that belong to others, whether it be their possessions, whether it be their spouse, whether it be their relationship, whether it be anything. The only thing that the word of God teaches we ought to covet from others is the gifts of the Holy Spirit. He says, earnestly covered that you may prophesy and the best gifts and all of that. And so there's, there's this desire and dissatisfaction with life that many people are drawn into a covetousness. And the word of God says that it is not acceptable for believers whatsoever. And then verse four, he says, let there be no filthiness or foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. And so immediately once he deals with sexual immorality, because sexual immorality, sexual sin is unique. It is the only way in which you sin against your own body. It is unique. Don't play with that. Then he goes and he says, look, your mouth, it needs to be pure. It needs to be clean. There shouldn't be any filthy uh, language, any filthy kind of communication. There ought to not be any foolish kind of talk. You know, sometimes the jokes that we make and he says, no, crude joking. It's not only that it's uh, R-rated joking or inappropriate in terms of, of PG or, or parental guidance type of standard, but many times people that call themselves Christians use explicit language, swear words. On other occasions, they use words to insult or to gossip or to talk down others, and all of that is not acceptable among the saints. Why? Because God is building a family and a body that builds itself up, not a body that tears one another apart. And then he says, these are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. So that means complaining, murmuring, part of the foolish talking, part of filthiness. And you say, yeah, but are we saying that we, we're not allowed to just, you know, express ourselves freely? Sometimes I just feel down. I just want to talk negative. The word of God teaches that we ought not to do that because our mouth is very much involved in the direction of our lives. And so you might ask yourself, how do I express these things? Go and pray. In the place of prayer, we can really openly, with great respect, speak, speak to our Heavenly Father openly concerning every anxiety, every burden, every pain. But it's not something that we ought to publish all over the nation. Now, it is definitely acceptable to share with someone that I'm going through a difficult time and, and to, 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 to confess that and to admit to a weakness, to be able to say, help me pray with me and all of that. But that's not what he's addressing here. Here he's addressing a kind of negativity that goes contrary to your faith, almost uh, looks at God and says, there's nothing that even the Lord can do for me. And so if you're one of those people, you call yourself a Christian, but you like swearing, you, especially when you're with your drinking friends or, or your, your unsafe friends, you need to stop that today. This is not what I'm saying. The word of God is teaching it and it's inappropriate. If you want to call yourself a Christian, make your decision and live like it today. Then verse five says, for you may be sure of this. <laughs> That everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, meaning idolizing things, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. And Corinthians says the same things. Those who practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Same with Galatians. And so the Apostle Paul has been consistent. We've got many teachings in the church nowadays that speak about how you can live any way you like in sexual immorality, in impurity, in covetousness and greed, lying and stealing and, and fornicating and homosexuality. And you can just live the way that you like and it's all going to be covered by the long and high and, uh, and deep grace of God. The grace of God which has appeared unto all men, according to the book of Titus, teaches us 
to say no to ungodliness. If you are saying yes to ungodliness, it's not the grace of God. It's a licentiousness. It's a license to sin. You are turning the grace of God into a license to sin and promoting your path to destruction. And the word of God clearly says you have no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. And many times people have not had opportu opportunity to truly repent in these areas because the preachers have not taught it and have not preached the word of God as it is written. And so there's an opportunity even today. If you're one of those people, you look at yourself and you can consider yourself to be a hypocrite because on one side, you claim to be a Christian, but the word of God says that everyone who names the name of Christ must depart, must be, depart from ungodliness, depart from wickedness. If you're still okay with being drunk every other weekend and sleeping around and it's like there's no, there's no distinction between you and someone that has given, uh, the, given themselves over to the world and someone that is not safe. There's no change. If there is no change, if there's not a hatred, if you are not wrestling with your sins, if you are not overcoming in the area of your purity, your sexuality, then you need to ask yourself whether you are truly born again. And you must ask yourself that as soon as possible, because sometimes you never get the opportunity to make it right. So we're talking about the first principle here. You are called to imitate God. This is why he's giving these very clear ways of living. Start today. Don't wait any day longer. If you are sleeping with your girlfriend, tell her, look, I just listened to the word of God. God's word says I must imitate God. And therefore this relationship, I can no longer, we cannot longer sleep together. And I can no longer live with you like this. It's either we got married or we break up. That's it. That says how easy it is <laughs> to obey God. I, I, I know that it's not easy, but it's worth it. Hallelujah. It's worth it. Verse 6. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the things that he just mentioned, sexual immorality, impurity, and covetousness. He says, let no one deceive you, making you think that you'll still inherit the kingdom of God. No, 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 no. Don't be deceived, he says. D don't let anyone deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God, the anger of God comes on the sons, upon the sons of disobedience. And I like the tense here. He doesn't say will come. He says it's already appearing. It's already being revealed. It's already coming upon those who disobey God. Why? Your life will never ever be at the level of God's plan. It will always be subject to the destructive power of Satan and sin. And, and, and that is all worked into sin itself. The wages of sin is death. You don't have to ask death to come when you sin. Already, once you die, your conscience, once you sin, your conscience begins to die. Your faith begins to waver. Your, your, your whole spiritual walk begins to be hampered. There is no place where you allow sin in your life without death also being in the other hand. Verse 7, therefore... Therefore, because these things, because of these things, the wrath of God is coming on the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. Therefore, because of the fact that the wrath of God and the destructive power is, is, is with sin, don't partner with sin. Stay away with sin. Don't be deceived. Stay away from sexual immorality, impurity. Rid yourself from worldliness. Start today. And he says, do not become partners with people who do these things. Don't be their closest friend. Let them not be your best friend. You're going to have to choose. The, the word of God says, friendship with the world is enmity with God. Hallelujah. Why is the apostle Paul teaching so strongly? Because of the fact that he knows that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. This is no joking matter. If you are still stuck in your sins, and if you don't repent, Jesus said you will surely die in your sins. And we are teaching this because the word of God teaches it. And we are bold about it because that's the only way that people can be set free. You shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. Then he says, therefore, verse 7, therefore do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as the children 
of light. Consider yourself to be light and therefore light and darkness don't have any fellowship at all. You ought to be in discomfort when you are with people who don't love God. In fact, not only do they not love God, they hate God. They hate his word. When we're teaching uh, against sexual immorality, they're upset. When you teach against lying, they're upset. When you teach against adultery, they're upset because it's interfering with them just fully expressing all their desires that is based on their idolatry and their false belief about who God is. And then we're still here under the theme number one, you're called to imitate God. Verse nine. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. Those are your principles to guide you. Is it good in God's eyes? Is it right in God's eyes? Because there's such a thing as good and evil. There's such a thing as absolute right and wrong. And there's such a thing as is it true or is it false? Truths and lies. And the world might want to teach us and say, no, it's all based on your circumstances. It's all based on your situational ethics. It's all based on your situation, how you were raised out. No, it's not. It's all based on the word of God. He is the author of either what the distinction between good and evil, the distinction between right and wrong, the distinction between what is true and what is not true. And once we begin to touch on those things and begin to throw out the word of God in judging as to what is good and what is right and what is true, then it means that mankind himself will begin to establish his own standard of what is good and what is right and what is true. And we have seen it in the communist countries. We have seen it in the Marxist regimes of how men who become themselves God then begin to destroy everyone else. And then he says, Verse 10, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. It is important that we in our lives always have a sense what is pleasing to the Lord. It's not only enough that you just get born again and therefore I please God all the time. It's a lie. No, if you're born again and you're lying, it's displeasing to God. Even though you have the righteousness of Christ, it is still displeasing to the Lord for you to live in darkness, even though you have received the revelation of the truth. And when we begin to accept that we have the Holy Spirit currently, pertinently speaking to us in our lives concerning the things that please God and don't please God, we will begin to see ourselves hating evil. Where are the men in our generation who hate evil? Where are the women in our generation who hate evil? And when I say evil, it's not preachers preaching against <laughs> unrighteousness and that's evil and it's hate speech. No, evil is when someone is doing something contrary to the word of God. That's evil. That's evil. And where are those who hate evil? And then he says, verse 11, take no part, take no part, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. No, let's just cover this. No, expose them. The word of God says that anything that is not right and good and true and should be exposed. If you don't expose it, it's like people, you know, who know in their family, there are children who are being abused. Pedophilia is going on. That there's incest taking place. Some adult is taking advantage of another child and they keep it under wraps. It is completely ungodly. If you do not expose it, you are promoting it. What you do not expose, you promote. Sometimes you have information that someone is having an affair with someone else's husband and you are not saying something. You are promoting that. I, I tell you, and the Holy Spirit is not happy with those kind of believers that like to cover up things in the interest of promoting them because that's how darkness works. When you cover things up, there's enough darkness for that to prevail. And I'm telling you now that we're coming into the days in the church where wickedness will be exposed because the gift of discerning of spirits is coming back to the church. The word of knowledge is coming back into the church. There will not be a place to hide with wickedness. Either you choose to be righteous and stay with the light or you will have to leave. Hallelujah. Verse 12, for it is shameful. For it is shameful. So instead expose them. Do not take part in those works of darkness. Expose them for it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. 
You know, we've said this before, that there's this doctrine that came into the church about five, ten years ago, that apparently God wants to deliver you from shame. No, 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 no. God doesn't deliver you from shame by just uh, casting shame out. No, he delivers you from shame by repentance. The only way to be delivered from shame is by repentance. If you do not repent, shame must not leave you alone. Shame must do its work in your heart so that you don't feel you are going to shoot children at a school and you don't feel any shame. You are going to rape a woman and you don't feel any shame. You are going to dishonor your husband and you don't feel any shame. You are going to hurt your wife or your children and you don't feel any shame. What kind of psychopathetic uh, the society do we live in that don't have any sense of shame and the word of God says that it is shameful the apostle Paul many times says I say this to your shame so shame is very important it helps you to realize that I need to be sorrowful about these things and godly sorrow leads to repentance and then verse 13 he says uh, and we're still under principle number one you are called to imitate God Verse 13, but when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. Hallelujah. Very important. Many things in our lives, no one is telling us, no one is exposing it by the light, no, by the light of God's truth. No one is saying that this is wrong. And so it's not visible and people can't even repent from it. Then it says it becomes visible. When exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. And therefore it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. And so when the light of God, the truth of God's word is preached, the way that the apostle Paul said, I, 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 I did not cease to warn you day and night when we were reading in the first uh, sermon of the series. Day and night, I, I preached to you guys with tears, warning you, right? And when that was happening, people started leaving their witchcraft and leaving their idolatry until the temple of Diana and Artemis was closing down because the preaching of the word, the entrance of thy word brings light. And then continuing on Ephesians chapter five, verse 15, you are called to imitate God. He says, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but wise. Not as unwise, but wise. Making the best use of the time because the days are evil. And you need to ask yourself, even as a believer, as someone that calls themselves a Christian, am I using my time for the Lord? If someone looks at my schedule every day, will they say, well, look at the wisdom. Look at the time that is being spent in taking care of their family, in doing good works, in preaching the gospel, in learning the word of God, in attending church, in worshiping Christ, in giving, giving to, the, to the work of the Lord, giving to the poor, and can, in spending time discipling others, fellowshipping, helping. You know, can you see from your time that you are not just wasting, wasting your time because the days are evil. And verse 17, therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And this is a conclusionary statement of everything that he is saying. Because all these things are the will of God. And then he goes on to verse 18. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery or there's access or abuse. But be filled with the spirit and so he begins to go even further practically and namibia we this is very relevant to us because we are wor world famous for our beer and our alcohol and our drinkers we are olympic medalists when it comes to drinking and our, our capital city and other cities are filled with shabins that are fueling our, our gender-based violence and fueling all the dysfunction much of the dysfunction in our society and then he says do not be drunk with wine but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 19, speaking to one another, addressing one another, ad addressing yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always for everything to God 
the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And what he's saying here is this is the kind of drunkenness in the Holy Spirit, being filled with the Spirit, that is similar to being drunk with wine. Why do people drink? People drink in order to forget their pain, in order to overcome their anxieties, in order to deal with. And he says, instead of doing that, rather begin to grow in your worship life, spiritual songs, psalms, and singing hymns, making melody to the Lord with your heart. It causes the same thing. It causes your anxieties to go down. It causes you to forget the issues that you're facing and then giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And so I want to encourage you, if you've been in the world, you used to drink whenever you're stressed, you used to smoke and you're in drugs or whenever you're stressed and anxious, and all of that there's a way that you can deal with that as well in the kingdom and the kingdom way is to be drunk with the spirit to be filled with the spirit speaking to yourselves with psalms and spiritual songs speaking in tongues singing in tongues and then also giving thanks making melody in your heart you always need to be in a state of rejoicing and singing that's what the apostle paul wrote in philippians Chapter 4, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. When they were in prison, beaten with Paul and Silas, they were singing songs until there was an earthquake. So singing is not just in church um, when we come uh, to prepare the message. No, it should be the atmosphere of your life in order to keep anxiety at bay, depression at bay, stress at bay. Hallelujah. <laughs> So that's the first principle. You are called to imitate God. Now we're going on to the second one. Let your marriage imitate God. Now in the first week we spoke about how the, the worship of the goddess Diana was pushing a very matriarchal or a woman dominated society. And uh, Diana was a culmination of that to the point of worship. And so um, we spoke last week about how even in our modern culture, we've got Wonder Woman as an uh, analogy or a representation of Diana of the Ephesians and Artemis. And so uh, this is the big question that we're facing in our societies right now, because God is saying, we're, and we're talking about natural family today, and God is saying, look, I want you to imitate me. And one of the areas where you ought to imitate God is in the relationship between Christ and his bride, which is the marriage relationship between a husband and a wife. And this is why it's an abomination and a sacrilegious insult to God for people to be married in the church in the name of Jesus Christ, right? While they are marrying as homosexuals. This is completely unacceptable to God. Apart from the issues of your, of your senses and what you're feeling and the temptation that you're facing, don't exacerbate your sin by forcing it into the church and then asking God to kiss the forehead of that sin. It is completely unacceptable. Why? Because marriage is a holy institution that is portraying the relationship between Christ and his bride. And you know, there's, there's this major debate in our society right now against the patriarchy and everything that is, is uh, with men, power structures of a hierarchy of power structures where men dominate everything and they control everything. And apparently that's the most evil thing that was ever invented. And so now there's an upending of the that patriarch patriarchy and so the 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 big question that you have is what is the patriarchy okay this is the definition a patriarchal system is a societal a social system in which the father is the head of the household that's it because society doesn't start in the in the in the town square or in the marketplace or in the in the business place society doesn't start there because after you go to the business place and make your money and have your career you come back home and that is where the foundation of society lies. So that is, if you want to ask where the patriarchy is emanating, it comes from the home where children are birthed. And so this is the question. What is the patriarchy? It means it's a home where the husband, the father, the male is the head of the home, according to God's design. He made the male and female. Male and female created he them. God in his design is binary. That's it. There's another system called the matriarchal system. In this system, it's the mother that is, or the woman that is the head of the household. 
And so some of the meetings will be had, uh, held without the father involved at all. The father is subservient to the mother in the vision that she has for the family. And so there's a lot of push, even here from the 1960s, with the feminist movement towards a matriarchy, actually. The alternative is also uh, what they call a pediarchy, which is where the children are the ones who are the heads of the family. And even in the transgender debate, you see a lot of this coming through, that whatever the child is feeling, that's what we will go with. If they think they're a boy at the age of two, then so be it, even though they were born a girl. And I'm not talking about those who are intersex and have issues with their sexual um, um, uh, genetics or their sexual biology. No, we're talking about those who just have a said, I feel like it. And I know it's a controversial matter that we're addressing here, but the word of God deals with all of these matters. And it, it's why we all have to be born again, by the way. And so pediarchy is also wrong. You can't have children ruling the home. They are not even, they don't even know enough to be able to know what underwear to, to wear. <laughs> we, we have to train them. We have to potty train a two-year-old and now they're determining their sexual orientation and their, 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 their sexuality and their gender and all of that. It's a complete, complete perversion of God's standard. What's the other alternative? Anarchy. Anarchy just means chaos, no leadership, no headship. And many people would rather have that than to be led because the spirit behind them is rebellion. Anything that tells me against my desires, what ought to be done is, is, is I'm going to rebel against it. <laughs> I don't want my mom to tell me what to do. I don't want my, my dad to tell me what to do. I, I don't want God to tell me what to do. I'm my own God. And so you have anarchy, and in anarchy, you have disorder and destruction. And so now, the word of God. Point number two, let your marriage imitate God. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. I feel like I'm preaching at the wedding here. But this is the message that we usually bring there. It starts with wives. Very interesting. It doesn't go to the husband first. It goes to the wives. Because why? The wife is quite instrumental in promoting the unity in the marriage. It's like... Starting with the team and saying, guys, listen to your coach, right? Because if the husband is setting a direction, if the wife is not with it, guys, it, it's not going to work. And so the rebellion, even in the time of Adam and Eve, the rebellion starts with Eve. And then Adam follows. And that was the doctrine of Artemis. That the woman set the direction. The women are the ones who are driving and leading society. And the homes, primarily starting in the home. To the point where the belief of the Gnostics was that, that Adam was not the husband of Eve. That, that Eve didn't come from Adam. That Adam came from Eve. That, that Eve was, was Adam's mother. <laughs> You know, people will invent things for the sake of their rebellion. Anyway, let's go to the word. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Massive words in a society of pain. Now let me say this. I have sisters and I have a mother. And I know the challenges of being married to someone that you desire not to submit to. And this is the challenge, really, for the ladies especially, because we're talking in this chapter. If you are not going to submit to a guy, decide that before you marry him. Don't marry the guy and then later on be fighting with him for the rest of your life. And submission doesn't mean that you'll necessarily, uh, that you'll necessarily say yes and amen to everything that he says. But he is the team leader. He is the team leader. He is the one that will ultimately be accountable to God for the family. And then it says, you ought to submit to your own husbands as you submit to the Lord. And the Lord always gives direction, directives which are not easy always, but they are godly. And so a husband will get to the husbands in terms of how they ought to lead. But the wife, your responsibility before God is to, to be submissive. And then it says, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Oh my goodness, what a bizarre notion to our current culture. The husband is the head of the wife. 
The head decides things, leads things. And so you ought to pray for your husband for great wisdom in that big head of his. <laughs> because many times the only sense that you have of the husband is that all he has is a big head, but he's not the head. <laughs> and he's not taking the family ahead. <laughs> And so verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Very critical teaching here. So the husband it ought to behave himself like the hero and the savior of the wife, not the dictator of the wife, the savior, the hero. And many times heroes can be so frustrated when the, the, the person they are trying to help and save keeps getting into the same kind of danger. It risks the life of the hero. And many times husbands feel that because the wives are not submissive, they always have to rescue them out of trouble. Right. And, you know, it takes trust to submit to your husband. You have to. It's not a I'm just OK obeying you. It's from the heart. I'm entrusting my husband. I'm entrusting myself to you the same way that children entrust themselves to their parents. For for protection. And so in the way that you raise me, in the way that you lead me, in the way that you guide me, be 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 con be considerate. It says the wife is the weaker vessel. Be considerate. Verse 24. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. It's a tall order. Many would say, yeah, then I'm not getting married. <laughs> and that was really the Artemis belief that they shunned marriage. Marriage wasn't something that was really pro promoted. And so... The word of God is here teaching us what, what the foundations of imitating Christ, imitating God in our marriages, in our families, so that our families and the foundation of society can be built on Christ. Verse 25, husbands, here we go. It says to the husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. This is the key, the key um, um, marker of a loving husband. He continuously sacrifices himself for his wife. He gives himself up for his wife. That's what Christ did for the church. The, the wife is not perfect and doesn't earn that sacrifice. No, you are a wonderful husband in the way you sacrifice for the wife that you have chosen to marry. Verse 26, that he might sanctify her, set her apart, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. So the husband is supposed to use the word of God to, 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 to cleanse and to purify his wife and her thoughts. And, and so that brings the, the priestly ministry of the husband in the home very much to the fore. You can't just be silent, being critical, insulting the wife. No, you have to encourage her with the word of God correcting her with the word of God, guiding her with the word of God. All of those are loving. And then it says, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor. You ought to present your wife to yourself. You ought to present her in your mind, in your emotion, as a wonderful person because of the sacrifices and the investment that you are making in this woman. And then it says, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Hallelujah. And so there's something special that happens when the husband loves the wife. She becomes more wonderful. Now, this is where it changed around. Many wives are trying to be the husband who washes the, uh, to be the husband who washes her husband and, 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 and cleanses him and makes him now this without spot. No, your responsibility as the wife is not to change your husband. Pray for him, honor him, respect him, encourage him, help him. But his responsibility is to do this part. Don't usurp his role and now take over. And you know what the issue is? Many women choose the wrong mate. And you might say, yeah, pastor, but uh, all men are wrong. <laughs> they are in varying degrees of wrongness. <laughs> and so we all have to do our work. I'm telling you, it's true. A wonderful woman can bring the best out of a man. 
It's true. That potential is there. But she's not coming from a manipulative place. She's coming from a place of really en enhancing and helping his life. All right, let's keep on going. So we're looking here at letting your marriage imitate God. In the same way, husbands should love their wives. Verse 28. Husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. Here we go. He who loves his wife loves himself. The way, consider this, husbands, if you're going to love your wife, consider how you take care of yourself. Just do that for the wife. Just do that for your wife. And I know some wives are like, yeah, but he doesn't even bath. He doesn't even take care of himself. Husbands, I'm calling you up and I'm saying, come on, take care of yourself first. That's the responsibility of a bachelor. Not just for your mommy to take care of you, but you need to learn to take care of yourself. Once you learn how to take care of yourself, now you can take care of your wife and your children. Verse 29, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it just as Christ does the church because we are members of his body. And so he's saying, look, if you're beating your wife, you're beating yourself. If you're destroying the life of your wife, you're destroying your own life. If you're demeaning your wife, you're destroying, you're demeaning yourself. Why? Because you are one. And so this is very clear. There's no debate here. There's no deeper meaning here. Wives, submit to your husband. Choose a, a husband that you can submit to. Then submit to him as the church does, uh, as the church submits to Christ. Husbands, love your wife. Choose a wife whom you love. And if she is full of faults, love her because the church was full of faults when Christ died for her. Love her and you will begin to redeem her. Hallelujah. Through your husbandry. Then verse 31, therefore a man shall leave, not a boy, a man, so mature, a man shall leave. You can't just stay around your, your family home, your mom is taking care of you, you have a wife now. No, you ought to leave his father and his mother and hold fast, cleave, be together, not with his friends, with his wife. Cleave, hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound and I'm saying that it reflects Christ and the church. Once again, this is why the homosexuality is an abomination. Why? Because Christ represents the male. The, the, the church represents the bride. It's not Christ and his husband. Ooh, it's not Christ and his husband at all. And even for us to frame that, you can see the sacrilegious nature, the, the blasphemous nature of this picture that is a blasphemy against the picture that Christ has of Christ and the bride. Then it says, verse 33, however, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. You know, in our society, we are now on a trend of divorce. And many people... Uh, when they face challenges in the marriage, uh, the, the solution is now to get a divorce. And the word of God says in Malachi, I hate divorce. And he says that I hate the violence that is committed from a husband to the wife of his youth. And I'm a, I'm a, I'm a witness. I'm a witness to this kind of violence, says the Lord. And I hate divorce. And so divorce is never God's plan. Even if there's been infidelity, adultery, even if there's been any kind of abuse, though God is a redeemer of marriages. What will we recommend when the wife or the husband is in danger? We will press charges, we'll put the spouse in prison, and then the other spouse will visit them there. Hi, honey, how's it going in there? We brought you some food, we came to visit you. That is covenant love. Jesus doesn't divorce us. In the same way, if you wanna get married, be serious. We are dealing here with holy things that represent Christ and his bride. And so we believe in separation of bed and table until the parties repent and reconcile. And so we are not going to tell a wife to say, stay in the same house with a husband that is abusive. And we are going to confront that husband very clearly. And we've got enough lawyers in the church. We will even do the, the proceedings ourselves for free to put you in prison. If you're the kind of lawyer, you're the kind of husband, or you're the kind of wife that abuses your family. Amen. Just a, a, a few warnings there. <laughs> All right. And then thirdly and lastly, let your children and parenting imitate God. We're going over here to chapter 6, which will continue next week. It says, children, verse 6, 
chapter 6, verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. In the Lord, not just any parents, because some parents force you into all sorts of despicable sin. And they keep you from wanting to get saved and wanting to honor God. No, no. Obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. And the word of God will be clear as to whether something is contrary to the word of God or not. Then it says, honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land, in the land. And it says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And so even when we are disobeying our ungodly parents, we need to do it in an honorable way. Right? Even when the wife disagrees with her husband, do it in an honorable way that he will feel, wow, I feel so honored even though she's disagreeing. Right? Do it that way. In the same way with your parents, be careful. Parents hold federal positions in the spirit realm. They can bless and they can curse even if they are not saved. So be careful how you handle your parents. And a curse that is without, without cause will not remain. So if you were honorable, doesn't matter what curses are said over you, if you are honorable, even in the way that you disobey, right? The curse will not fall on you. And the blessing, it says the blessing is that it will go well with you that you, and you will live long in the land that the Lord has given you. There are some of you, you will need to repent and ask forgiveness from your parents for the way in which you, 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 you might have disagreed with your parents. You need to be careful. Parents are a blessing from the Lord, even though, and none of them are perfect. I'm telling you now, your parents might be more perfect than someone else's parents, even though you feel like committing suicide because of what they've done. I know that parents can be wicked, but the word of God says, obey them in the Lord. And if you disobey them, honor them at all times, especially for those of you who are now earning a living and you give nothing to your parents. May the Lord convict you concerning that. The word of God says that we ought to take care of our parents, especially if your mother is a widow. Take care of your parents of your mother. Don't let them become a burden on the church while you can take care of them. The word of God says that you are denying the faith in that case. And then it says that it may go well with you. And then it says, don't provoke your children to anger. But look at the contrast here as we close. The contrast here is if you bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, you won't provoke them to anger. It says, don't provoke your children to anger, but bring them up. And many people have this idea and the devil has promoted his lies in society saying that when you bring up a child in discipline and instruction, then you are provoking them to anger. It couldn't be further from the truth. It's when parents neglect their children when they are young, not even correcting them, guiding them. And then when they are in their teens, they now want to come a bit, a bit chested in the boy's room and push the boy around. He's going to karate chop you, daddy. <laughs> And so you ought to invest while they are young, not only with sweets and spoliation. No, I mean, it's wonderful to uh, be kind and good to your children, but discipline your children, correct them, give them instruction in the Lord while they are young. When they are older, they will praise you. They will honor you because they will have the wisdom to navigate life. Hallelujah. So the first principle is this, imitate God in your personal life. Number two, let your marriage imitate Christ and his bride. Number three, let your children imitate the Lord, the Lord's way. Let your parenting imitate the Lord's way. We are not here trying to build a society based on Scandinavian val uh, uh, values and all the latest new uh, research by the latest PhDs that don't believe in, in family. No, we are taking the word of God as our standard because the word of God is the path of life and righteousness for any society. And so we're preaching this. If you're um, in a situation where it's so uh, almost difficult to apply this. The wisdom of God is coming to you if you're willing to obey the law. And I know that there are many of you out there, you might have gone through a divorce already. You're on the other side of the divorce and you're asking the question, the grace of God is sufficient for you. There are some of you, you have struggled through sexual immorality and you're trying to come out. The grace of God is sufficient for you. Just don't look back and cover the, the ways of Egypt. 
You keep walking straight to the promised land of purity and holiness. And then there are some of you, your parents have not been great at all. In fact, it's been abusive. Forgive them. Forgive them, genuinely forgive them and bless them and guard your heart so that you will not pass that same thing over to your children. Hallelujah. Let's pray together and we'll see one another again next week as we continue to conclude this book. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you, Lord, that you correct and guide those whom you love, Lord, and those whom do not desire to be corrected and disciplined are illegitimate children. And Father, we thank you, Lord, that yeah, in the areas where we are struggling, Holy Spirit, you are the helper. We thank you that you are stepping in right now to help. I pray for those who are not born again. If you are not born again, pray with me right now. Say, Lord Jesus, my eyes are open. I realize that I'm a sinner. I realize that I'm living contrary to your word. Today, I humble myself. I come on the basis of your word, believing that Jesus died for me on the cross, that in three days he was raised from the dead, that Jesus is alive today. And I say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Be the Lord of my life. Lead me, cleanse me, transform my heart, and I'll live for you. Help me, Holy Spirit, to imitate you in my life, in my marriage, in my family. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. If you pray that prayer, please send us an email. The details are on this on this video, please send us an email and we will give you material that will help you grow. There's somebody, I see a, a married couple, you're watching together and you fight a lot. And I hear the Holy Spirit saying, fight for your marriage. Don't fight against each other and begin to forgive one another and begin to apply this principle of submitting. Wife, submit your husband. Husband, love, love. Do whatever is necessary to be a blessing to your wife and you will see your marriage turning around. Amen. I see it's like the lady's name is Susan or Sarah, something like that. Yeah, may God continue to turn your marriage around. He's doing a miracle in your lives. Amen. There's someone else is like suicide because of parenting. The way that you were raised is causing depression and suicide. And the Holy Spirit is saying, forgive. And you will see the hand of the Lord and the light of God coming into your life. It's like you've gone into all sorts of um, sexual immorality, in fact, homosexuality because of that. And the Holy Spirit is breaking that chain today and you're being set free in order to live for the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. May God bless you once again. A reminder, partner with us with the building and we will see you soon. And if you're joining us, bring your blanket along. It's a little bit chilly, but we will see you soon. May God bless you. Have a wonderful week. Thank you for listening. For more information about this podcast and other resources, please visit envintook.org.